One minute. Oh, hey, what's that? Um, do you... How do I look? Okay. Katie? <laughs> Good evening. Welcome to the Vancouver Aquarium uh, for our special event tonight. Uh, we're going to be talking about monster waves, the ripple effect caused by the Japanese tsunami of 2011. About 20 years ago was the first time I started collecting marine debris on the shorelines, and this was in Hawaii, uh, where I study marine biology. And uh, I always thought of it as garbage to build bridges and make a positive out of the uh, tsunami and the related debris that came across the Pacific. Um, what's happened as a result is that there's a new story that's emerging, a story about people, uh, about people coming together and uh, raising awareness about a very important issue that's threatening our oceans. Uh, and it's been a great story, and it's really... Um, uh, touched my heart, and uh, our, our presentation tonight uh, is, I think, going to do a very good job at kind of unfolding and, and showing you that story uh, about people coming together and, and uh, learning about how we can work together to raise awareness about marine debris and how we can help solve some of those marine debris issues. Um, and actually start to refer to marine debris as something else, perhaps. Uh, so our speaker tonight is Kate Lesueff. She's the manager of the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. Uh, she was also the Tsunami Debris Cleanup Coordinator here at the Vancouver Aquarium for the Shoreline Cleanup. Uh, she's been on trips to Japan and has met a lot of people that have been impacted by the tsunami uh, and has very rich experience uh, with this particular topic. So, uh, and she's originally from Australia. Uh, so if we could give a warm welcome to our speaker tonight, Kate Lesueff. Thank you. So as Jonathan said, my name is Kate Lesueff. I am now the manager of the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup. When I started, I started as the tsunami debris were washed out into the ocean. The currents of the Pacific Ocean carried these items from the shorelines of Japan to the shores of North America, where it washed up onto some of the most remote beaches you can imagine. So today I'm going to tell you about the cleanups we've been doing here in BC, about my recent trip to Japan, and about what all of this has been able to teach us. This presentation is really for anybody because it's about the human impact of a tragedy and the connections that the ocean creates around the world. It's just an outline of what I'm going to be talking about tonight. I'm going to introduce my program, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup, uh, talk about the tsunami and our cleanups and my trip to Japan. So for those of you who don't know, the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup is a conservation initiative. It's a partnership between the Vancouver Aquarium and WWF. We started in 1994 and each year we have tens of thousands of Canadians register through our website to coordinate cleanups, to attend cleanups throughout the country. So last year we had nearly 55,000 volunteers um, register through our website at almost 2,000 sites across Canada. So with a shoreline cleanup, we define a shoreline as any place where land connects with water. So this isn't just beaches and coastlines like we see here in BC, this is lakes and rivers and uh, lots of inland waterways that are still really important. So we encourage people to go out into their shorelines and to pick up whatever garbage they find there to prevent these things from getting out into our waterways and into our oceans. I'm going to be using a couple of terms tonight that I want to find. The first one is marine debris. Marine debris is waste, in this context, is waste that's created by humans that's been deliberately or accidentally released into a lake, sea, ocean or waterway. So we're really talking about man-made items here. Tsunami debris is a type of marine debris and it was generated by the tsunami in 2011 in Japan. Some people who survived the tsunami in Japan, they really don't like the term tsunami debris or how it translates into Japanese. 
because the word debris sort of just sounds like garbage. And personal items that were lost in the tsunami were not garbage. So some people don't like this term. Um, we, we use it with respect. We understand that people lost a lot of their personal items, but unfortunately a lot of the things that we find on our beach are not valuable and they're not traceable. I'm sorry for the image being a little light in the corner. Um, so it's important to realise some of the impacts of marine debris and why we care about these man-made items on our beaches. So some of you may have seen some of these pictures before. Uh, this picture down here is an albatross found in Midway Atoll. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And if you have a look in here, this is its stomach and it's full of plastic. This is a cigarette lighter here. There's also bottle tops. This animal has been eating plastic. This is one of the impacts of shoreline litter. Up here we have, this is a whale that's been entangled in a net. Nets, um, rope, lots of fishing gear can entangle animals like this and unfortunately it's becoming more common to see things like this along our coasts. In the top right hand corner is the Vancouver Aquarium's Marine Mammal Rescue Team. Um, you might be able to see, uh, this is our, our vet Marty on a boat and they're leaning over the side to a sea lion. The sea lion has a piece of rope around its neck or it could be a packing band. We find hundreds of sea lions like this on the west coast of Vancouver Island. Um, and our vet team actually goes out and they anaesthetise these animals in the field and they disentangle them. Um, it's really incredible work, but it is very complicated and it can be very dangerous. So what we'd really prefer to do is to prevent these items, like these packing bands, from getting out into the water in the first place. The image in the bottom right, I realise is really hard to see, but this is a little shot of um, something called microplastics. So one of the impacts that we're just starting to realise about marine debris and plastic in our ocean is that it breaks down. The longer that things are left out in a beach, they break down into smaller and smaller pieces. So this is a view from a microscope showing some of these tiny little pieces of plastic. These threads that are here, these are also plastic. These actually come from the fleeces, we think. These come from the fleeces that we have that are uh, made of synthetic materials. Gets out into the ocean and we can actually see these things under the microscope. So all of these pictures are showing you that there are lots of impacts of marine debris. Our man-made items out in our beaches can have a lot of impacts on wildlife and on waterways. Microplastics, um, are, the more people research them, the more they're finding out about the negative impacts of microplastics because they're really easy for an animal to eat. So to talk about the tsunami a little bit, um, on March 11th, 2011, a magnitude 9.0 earthquake struck off the coast of Japan. Again, sorry, this is a little light, but the epicenter was out here. Um, the earthquake itself didn't actually cause that much, uh, that many deaths, but it was the enormous tsunami that was generated by it that did most of the destruction and caused most of the damage. Japanese people, um, they have a lot of a lot of drills and a lot of practice and emergency procedures. So people responded quickly and in the right way to these disasters, to this disaster. So it could have been a much, a much bigger loss. But as it was, about 360,000 houses were destroyed. Um, I think that's about the number of houses in Metro Vancouver. And around 19,000 people were killed. So uh, this map just shows some of the heights of the tsunami um, right at the coast. So I realise there's a lot of information on here. But if you look at the red numbers, they're the numbers that are really big. So up in this area up here, uh, the tsunami was around 8 metres up to 9 metres at the coast. But what this map actually doesn't show is that in a lot of areas, the tsunami was actually funnelled uphill and so it reached areas that were a lot higher than this. And in some cases, waves as big as 8, 9 and 10 metres could travel up to 8 kilometres inland. So the tsunami um, affected this part of the coast here the most. You guys might have heard of Fukushima, which is also in this area. Um, if you really want to see the impact of this tsunami, I really recommend you watch some of the videos on YouTube because it's difficult to grasp the scale of this um, disaster until you see those things. This is just one shot I'm going to share with you guys. Um, and the thing that I want to reiterate about a tsunami is that the wave, firstly, it moves really fast. When you watch the videos, you see that there's no, there's no outdriving a tsunami, there's no outrunning it. 
Um, and the other thing that's really obvious about it is that it's not a wall of water. This is not a big wave coming at you, because as this wave travels, it picks up parts of buildings, it picks up cars, it picks up concrete. And so you're not being overcome by a wave of water, you're being overcome by a wave of debris. And there's nothing you can do to get away from that if it's too late. This picture shows one of the flat areas and there are a lot of flat plains where the tsunami could travel really far inland. So the tsunami was really destructive. It destroyed a lot of buildings and it washed a lot of material out into the ocean. This is just a little diagram to show what happened to it. Um, the Japanese government estimated that 5 million tonnes of debris were washed out by the tsunami out into the ocean. And a lot of that stuff was heavy stuff, cars and concrete, and, and about 70% of it sank in the shorelines off Japan. The remaining 30%, so about 1.5 million tonnes, was floating debris. And that was carried off into the ocean, um, away from Japan, and out into the Pacific Ocean. So this map is just a map of the currents in the Pacific Ocean. So the arrows, in the, it's kind of like a, um, a road map. The arrows indicate the direction of the currents. So if Japan's over here, you can see that if something was floating at the surface here, it could be carried by this current all the way across the ocean to the west coast of North America. And from here, it could either go south in this current or it could go north up to Alaska. So a lot of the floating items were washed out from Japan into the ocean and they became part of this system. Um, you may have heard of the, the garbage patch in the middle of the ocean. Um, that's in here. And so most, sorry, some of the tsunami debris would have ended up in this area as well. So where did the tsunami debris go? If we look at that map, all those currents were kind of leading towards the west coast of North America. Um, so tsunami debris was found um, in the States, in California and Oregon. The thing that I want to point out about BC's coast here, if any of you have ever been to, say, Tofino or Ucluelet, those are really two of the biggest towns that we have on the west coast of Vancouver Island here. And a lot of the other areas are just totally remote and you can't get to them easily. You can't drive to them. Um, there's no towns there. There's not going to be a recycling facility for whatever you do pick up. So there's, a, there's not many towns, not many roads, very exposed coastline. Um, and that's true for Haida Gwaii, all this part of the coast in here, and most of Vancouver Island. So after the tsunami, um, when items started to wash up in, um, in BC and in North America, which happened in around, people started seeing it sort of early 2012, um, the Japanese government made a gift to North America, firstly to the US and also to Canada, um, to assist with the cleanups of these, this material. And the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup were really lucky to be one of the recipients of this funding. So we received our funding in March last year for cleanups, uh, volunteer-based cleanups um, of, of shorelines affected by tsunami debris on the west coast of Vancouver Island. So that's that really remote coastline with very few roads and no towns. So we were able last summer to start coordinating and funding some cleanups um, along the west coast. So we were able to help Surfrider Vancouver Island. Um, they're a great group of surfers based out of Victoria. Um, and they, every year they organise a remote cleanup. They also do monthly cleanups all around Victoria. And we were able to fund their cleanup to Raft Cove, um, which is up in the northern tip of Vancouver Island. So they had a group of about 20 volunteers, including um, I think they're mostly surfers. <laughs> and they were able to go on a, a surfing and clean up trip. Um, and they were able to remove 1.5 tonnes of debris. So this is some of the stuff you can see here. There's a helicopter in the background of this picture. Um, there's a little boat here, a lot of fishing boys. And then in August last year, uh, we were also able to help Living Oceans to go out and do their clean up um, at Sea Otter Cove. That's up in the northern tip of, it's a little bit further north than Raft Cove, where Surf Rider went. And this is a really difficult to access area, so there's a lot of logistics of moving things around and towing things by raft. Um, and Living Oceans was able to remove around 2.7 tonnes of debris from this shoreline. So you can see it here in the big bins. Um, 
ready to be sorted and recycled. And then in September last year, I, we coordinated a cleanup in collaboration with Parts Canada on the West Coast Trail, um, which is down here. So um, we took a group of about 13 volunteers, some of who are here tonight, um, out on the West Coast Trail for a three day cleanup. Um, and we had a really incredible cleanup out there. We were able to re remove four tonnes of debris. You can see in this picture just some of the logistics of trying to get this stuff off the beach. We find such huge volumes of debris on beaches that you can't just carry it out on your back or it, there are no roads out here. So the only way to get some of this stuff out safely is to use things like helicopters. So we're able to carry this. This down here is about four bags. Um, and they're each about this big. Um, and then the, the, one of the hardest parts about doing remote cleanups like this is what to do with all the stuff you find. And so that's me there in the pink card hat at the recycling yard, um, sorting out what we found and trying to recycle everything that we possibly could from what we found on the beaches. So these are the cleanups that we coordinated last year. Um, over here, this is one of the items that we think is from, the, um, from Japan. Um, it's a fishing crate that are used, they're often used by fishermen in Japan. And you can sort of see, and if you're on the cleanup, you might have seen it, it was partially melted, and we think it was actually part of a burning island of debris after the tsunami. So the most common question we get asked is, what do you find on these cleanups? And yes, we do find Japanese items. Um, but the thing that was more overwhelming and more saddening to me is that tsunami items are just a fraction of what we see out there. Um, and so these are some of the sort of everyday items we find. If we start at the bottom here, along the bottom, there's some fishing buoys, fishing nets, big pieces of foam. And so some people say, oh, well, industry should be doing something. This comes from fishing or this comes from shipping. And for sure, there are definitely initiatives that need to happen with these kind of industries to prevent these sort of items getting out into the ocean and washing up on our shores. But if you look at the items at the top, you guys might recognise some of these from your own life. Up here, these are plastic drink bottles. That's a plastic plate, a soccer ball, a boot, a fridge. That's a pen. I just kind of wanted to reiterate that the things that we find on the beach, we are each using. Everybody uses them in their everyday life and they are getting out into the ocean and they are washing up on our beaches. The other thing that really struck me about a lot of this is that everything we find is plastic. Almost everything we find is plastic. Um, that's because plastic survives really well out in the ocean. It's kind of perfect. It's durable, it's long lasting, it's often toxic, and even when it breaks down into tiny pieces, it's still really unsafe. So it lasts and it lasts in the ocean. And so you can find these things some of which are here, some Japanese items that are plastic, they're really sturdy, they last a long time. Which brings me to the Japanese items that we find on our beaches. Um, these are just a selection of some of the things that we see. For those of you who've been out on these remote coasts of Vancouver Island, you might recognise um, the bottom right photo, which is some lumber. Um, it's wooden lumber from a house in Japan. We can tell that by the... Um, the types of woodwork joints and notches on these uh, pieces of wood. They're really distinctive when you're out on the beach. Some of the other things, um, this little shoe, which is right here, um, which is, I think, used by Japanese people to clean their bathrooms, but we found that on the beach too. And lots of other Japanese items, um, a lot of crates. Um, this one up here has a hand carved symbol on it, which you can't really see, but if you look at this one here, you can see a hand painted symbol. There to indicate uh, each fisherman has a different kind of symbol, so they can pick out which ones are theirs. Um, these are property markers, uh, which come from, we find them from a lot of towns that were destroyed by the tsunami. And then this was a pretty cool find on a cleanup in Haida Gwaii that I went on from the tsunami. Maybe that was just everyday garbage, it's hard to know. So after doing these cleanups um, and sort of doing some of our own research into what we'd found, we were really excited to be part of an event organised by a Japanese nonprofit. So this group, uh, the Japan Environmental Action Network, or GENE for short, um, organised a really great symposium right here. Uh, one of the events was right here in, um, in this theatre. And 
we had people from, we were really excited to be involved, and there were people from Hawaii, from Washington, Oregon, Alaska. Um, and we all came together to share what we've been seeing on the beaches and to talk about how we do things and to be able to share all that kind of information. Um, and it was a really cool experience to be part of that because a lot of us have seen the same things and we use the same kind of methodologies. And after this event, I was really excited to be invited to Japan. So this is in October, uh, the trip to Japan was in November last year. Um, and the point of that trip was to go and learn about the impact of the tsunami and to start to put together a network of shoreline cleanup groups around the Pacific. So it's the map of Japan showing the places that we went to, the main places that we went to on our trip. Um, I really didn't know that much about the trip before we went. Um, and until this point, really what I knew about the tsunami was some photos, a couple of videos, and what we'd seen on the beaches. There was nothing, no real personal connection that I had to any of this. Um, so we started in Tokyo with a really great workshop with a bunch of non-profits and the Japanese government. We're really thrilled to see how um, involved the Japanese government was and how excited they were to learn about what they could help with. Um, and then we travelled up to Sakata here, which is actually on the Sea of Japan, um, to see some of the everyday garbage in Japan. And then, then we went to Sendai on this side of on the Pacific coast. Um, and we spent maybe four days around Sendai, which was an area that was really hard hit by the tsunami. The first thing I noticed um, in Japan was, was sort of an, um, an opportunity to put some of the things we see on our beach in perspective. So on the left is a photo of um, a pottery store in Japan, and you can see this wooden beam. And then on the right is a clean up in Euclid that I was on. And so you can see that it sort of hit me that these are the, they're part of a really solid structure. Um, these beams and these structures, it was sort of made me really imagine the force of the tsunami that had to come through to wipe out these things and carry them across the ocean to where we find them on the beaches. So next we travelled to Sakata, which is the Sea of Japan. And this is the beach that we visited. So I just want to reiterate, this is not tsunami debris. This is everyday garbage that's coming in from the Sea of Japan. Sea of Japan is shared by China, Japan, Korea and Russia. And this beach had been cleaned one or two months before this. So this stuff um, is really similar to what we see on our beaches. There's packing strands and packing straps and bands. There's plastic bottles, a Hello Kitty flip-flop. Um, <laughs> All the kinds of things that we see on our beaches, it was kind of devastating to see them there, but in such high quantities. So we, we saw that beach, it was kind of a good eye opener of the everyday garbage problem, but then we went across to the tsunami um, stricken area. And we drove from the, we, we drove in from the countryside, I guess, and so, we were in a bus and I hadn't realised we were anywhere near the coast and this is a really blurry photo but I took it out of the bus that we were travelling in because I suddenly realised that when I looked around there were no houses and Japan, there's a lot of people living in Japan so everywhere you can build houses there are houses um, and it really actually I thought to myself, gee this is a housing development and it's not actually selling that well until, until I realised that we were actually in the disaster zone and that we, weren't, we were a couple of k's from the ocean here. Um, and that there used to be a whole town standing where we were, um, but the entire town was completely destroyed by the tsunami. And everything is cleaned up and everything's been removed. And all you can see, it's not clear in this photo, but all you could see was the sort of concrete foundations of where these houses used to stand. Um, in this area, this is one of the areas where the tsunami wave was around eight, 10 metres high and it travelled 8 kilometres inland. Um, and as you might expect, some people really don't want to move back to this area. So next we went to a town called Yuriagi. Um, Yuriagi is a fishing town with around 7,000 people. Um, around 1,000 of those 7,000 people were killed by the tsunami. Um, so we actually had this public event where we were able to talk to people in the community there about what we've been seeing on the beaches of BC. Um, I, was, I was part of a group travelling around Japan that included representatives from Washington State, uh, from Euclid on the island, 
um, and Hawaii. So we were able to present our results, that's me talking on the left, um, to a group of people who had come to learn about what we've been finding. Um, and it was really humbling to present there to people who have lost everything. So next, we, after the public event, we toured some of the areas that were affected by the tsunami. Um, and this is one area that we were taken to. On the left is Hannah, Hannah Ko, and she is a Vancouver resident, but she's from Japan. And she introduced us to this incredible group of full-time volunteers. And um, after the tsunami, Hannah actually travelled back to Japan and she stayed there for about 14 months and she volunteered her time full-time. Um, and thousands of people throughout Japan were doing this to help people who'd been affected by the tsunami. And they're still doing it. Um, so there's still people out rebuilding houses for people who are living in temporary housing. Hannah, for example, she learned how to use a chainsaw and how to use an excavator and she helped rebuild and muck out and she even told me she taught kids English as well. So there was this really incredible spirit of volunteerism there where everybody was just, they saw such a need to help and they wanted to be part of it. And more than that, Everybody who was volunteering was so humble and so gracious. They were actually really grateful to be able to volunteer. So um, this is one of the areas that we were touring uh, that was affected by the tsunami. And in the middle in the hat is um, just here. This is a man called Mr. Takahashi. And his house used to stand where we are. The thing that's kind of surprising to me about Mr. Takahashi's house is that from where you stand, the ocean is, is where we're looking, but you can't see it from there because he's up a valley. And he's actually about 25 metres above sea level here, um, which I wouldn't have thought you'd be in any danger from a tsunami. Um, but the tsunami wave was funnelled into the valley and it just kept on going. And the wave had nowhere to go. It kept on going uphill. Um, and in fact, at the top of the hill, it hit a steep area and it turned around and it came back and it created a whirlpool. And so Mr. Takahashi told us that people were running away from, from the tsunami and they were running uphill and the wave turned around and they actually ran straight into the wave. Um, the only reason that Mr. Takahashi survived is because he climbed one of the trees back here. Um, so his house was destroyed, but he survived. So with the help of the volunteers, um, Mr. Takahashi's house is being rebuilt on a hill nearby um, where it will be safe from a tsunami next time. But he lost 14 relatives to the tsunami. Um, we then travelled a little bit closer down to the water. Um, and you can see I'm pointing up to, the, to something up here. There's a black fishing boy hanging in the tree. Um, I'm also a few metres above sea level here. And the height of this, the tsunami travelled at least as high as that black boy up there. So it just gives you some perspective on how enormous the, the force of this thing was. Um, and everything looks pretty clean around this area. It all looks like it's been cleaned up. But it doesn't take much to sort of dig through some of the rubble down around my feet there. And you find things like this, which is a little piece of bowl. And there's little pieces of ceramics are found all along this shoreline. So they're pieces, parts of people's houses. Um, I imagine you'd be able to see those impacts for a really long time to come. Um, many of the villages that were destroyed by the tsunami were fishing villages. So they were really dependent on fishing uh, for their economies. So imagine that you're a fisherman um, and maybe you survived the tsunami but you lost your house, you may have lost your boat um, and you may even have lost your loved ones. And now even if you could somehow get out into the water to go fishing, it turns out that there's no fish. Because in addition to all the damage um, that happens above ground, a tsunami can also destroy fish habitat on the bottom of the ocean. That's because firstly the wave can come through with such force that it destroys the habitat and then secondly, after the tsunami destroys a lot of houses, the construction material comes back out into the ocean where it sinks. So anything that was left after the wave went through is smothered by whatever's dropped. 
So we were really um, fortunate to be able to work with, or to be able to watch this dive group from the Sea Beautification Society. Um, they're volunteer divers and they've been doing lots of cleanups all along the coast of, of Japan um, to remove tsunami debris. And on this day, they were actually going out to construct some artificial habitat for squid. So the hope is that the squid will come back and that the fishing economy will be able to rebound. Um, the next place that we went to um, was in a little town called Okawa. So this is an aerial photo showing um, before the tsunami. So the school and its evacuation centre for this area. So as I said, a lot of Japanese people, they have a lot of training drills and they know how to evacuate and where to evacuate and what to do in an emergency. So the tsunami came through this area. This is a photo afterwards. Um, you can see that all this low-lying ground down here has been completely flooded by water. This is sort of a, maybe a month after the tsunami, maybe a little more. But all the houses that were here are gone. This bridge has been destroyed. So I just flick back to the last bit that's before. You can see how many houses there were. And then this is after. Um, so, sorry. The school down here was the evacuation centre for this area. Um, and there were also school kids there that day. Um, and so everybody evacuated there, but for some reason there was, um, there was a bit of a mix up with, with the messaging that went out. And the teachers, uh, they had all the children in the playground, but they didn't, yeah, they were on flat ground down here. This is still relatively flat ground. Um, this is a picture showing, this is the school here, and this is a hill next to the school. So you may have heard that if a tsunami comes, you're supposed to find higher ground. But for whatever reason, these students didn't evacuate up there. Um, if they had, they could have run up this hill and they, they probably would have all survived. But there was some confusion and they remained in the school. And there was about 100 kids in the school that day and around 75 of them were killed. It's an elementary school. Um, and there was around 10 teachers as well who died. So the kids who did survive by some instinct, ran up that hill. And there's a story of a little boy who, I think he was around seven and he was on crutches and he survived because his friend carried him on his back up the top of that hill. This is a concrete building. Everything around here was destroyed um, and everything else has been cleaned up. But this school has been left as it is because some of the kids were never found. Um, and so a lot of people go there to pay their respects. You can just see the force of the tsunami coming through this concrete building here. Um, the day we visited was a really cold and windy day and this is definitely the saddest place I've ever been. So, after all that, what have we learned? What can we really say about all these things? The first thing is tsunami debris is still arriving in BC. I think this is really important for us all to recognise. There's still things washing in every single day. Um, after every single storm, if you go to a beach on the west coast of BC, you'll probably see Japanese items out there. So we'll continue to see the effects of these items on our shoreline. We want to continue to tell this story and we want to continue to provide any kind of means possible to return items that are personal uh, to their owners. Second thing we've learned, tsunami debris is not preventable. Debris from a disaster is not something you can blame somebody for. But everyday garbage in our oceans, that is preventable. Put this in perspective, disaster debris from things like a tsunami is a really tiny, tiny proportion of what we find on the shorelines. It's the everyday garbage that's generated by um, our patterns of consumption that's getting out into the ocean, and that's the main parts of marine debris that we see. Networks make a difference. So I traveled around Japan for a week with this really incredible group. And this is people from the Ministry of Environment in Japan, nonprofits, the group Gene, who paid for a trip out there, um, and some of the other nonprofit groups from around North America. Um, we, we spent a week traveling together and the tragedy of the tsunami is what brought us together. 
And the trip was really overwhelming. It was really confronting. But it was an, also, we recognised it was a really incredible opportunity for us to all work together. We have a lot to learn from each other. And so we've actually created a network of shoreline cleanup organisations after this. We stay in contact. Um, and we're committed to working together for cleaner shorelines all around the ocean. The Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup has over 20 years of experience and I think we have a lot to be able to share with other groups as well as a lot to learn from other groups. The biggest lesson that I've learned from all of this is that we're all connected. Ocean currents on one side of the world have carried disaster debris all the way over to Canada. A natural disaster on the other side of the ocean affects us. And with every item that we find on Canadian shorelines that's Japanese, we share the pain and the tragedy of the tsunami with our neighbours across the ocean. A lot of people have asked me why the Japanese government gave us money to clean up shoreline debris when they were the ones who suffered the disaster. And my standard answer is firstly that they genuinely feel guilty about all of the debris that's washing up on our shores. And this is definitely one aspect of the donation. A lot of people who we saw in Japan apologised to us for, some, for a natural disaster that they didn't cause, they apologised. But as I spoke about our cleanups in Japan, I realised that the donation was much more than just generosity. Thousands of Japanese people lost loved ones in the tsunami and as well as all of their possessions. Mr. Takahashi, he lost 14 of his relatives. And looking at the faces in that crowd, I saw a glimmer of hope that a memento from somebody who was lost in the tsunami might have survived and travelled across the ocean. Personal items can provide a link to the past and a connection to somebody who didn't survive the disaster. So the, the donation from Japan supported cleanups, but more importantly, provided a way for us to collect and return personal items to survivors who've already lost so much. So we'll continue to make every effort to identify anything that's personal and traceable on cleanups um, and return it to individuals in Japan. So after seeing the faces in the crowd, I appreciate the power in returning items from a lost loved one. So we've also, I've also realised cleanups are our best way of connecting action to impact. We will continue to talk with our volunteers through the most effective medium we have, which is direct action on our beaches. The effect of a cleanup is really twofold. Firstly, you're having a direct impact on your shoreline by removing man-made items that shouldn't be there. Um, this protects wildlife and waterways from the impacts of our waste. But the second impact is a really long-lasting one, where we hope that people's behaviour is really impacted. Because once you've seen some of these items on a shoreline cleanup, we really hope that you'll reassess your own waste production and that you'll really think about um, how you live, the, the kinds of products that you use in your everyday life. And lastly, garbage in the ocean really is everybody's problem, but it's also a really big opportunity to make a difference. Um, I've said the word tsunami a lot. I've said it thousands of times since I started working on this project. But after going to Japan and seeing what we saw, the word has really changed for me. Um, I can't forget what I saw and I don't want to. It was, the tsunami was a human tragedy and it evokes emotion. So we want to tell this story and explain how, how debris travelled from Japan to Canada and also how, how garbage in the ocean is a reality um, today. We also want to use this, this story, though, to empower people and to engage them by showing that we can all be part of the solution. Our shorelines are covered in garbage, but there is a solution to this. For example, in January, my co-worker Tanya committed to attempting to try and live plastic-free for 2015. That means no plastic straws, no plastic shampoo bottles, no plastic wrapped cheese. And why, you might ask? Because she recognised the importance of being able to reduce the amount of plastic that she's generating. Now, this might not work for everybody, um, but we do all have the power to do these kind of things. We all have the power to reduce our consumption of plastics, which could mean getting a reusable water, uh, water bottle or taking your reusable coffee mug with you or taking a bag to the supermarket so that you don't have to use any more plastic. We can all say no to single-use plastics because now we know that despite our best efforts, these things are getting out into the ocean and they're having an impact. 
If you want to follow Tanya's journey, you can watch, read her blogs at aquablog.ca. You might be wondering what else you can do. Best of all, you can sign up and join us on the beach. I would really love for each of you in this room to commit to coordinating a clean-up your, at your local shoreline. This could be your child's school or with some of your friends or through your workplace. This story has really taught, us, taught me that we are all connected and the impacts that we have on our ocean come from our everyday actions. So by going down to our local shoreline, we are preventing things from getting out into the ocean where they have a really negative impact. Um, the best thing about coordinating a shoreline cleanup, we have all the resources and all the support that you need. Um, we have people available on the phone and people you can email. I have Jean here who can, you can also chat to at the end if you'd like any more information. Um, and it's really easy to do. You can visit us at shorelinecleanup.ca. So just to finish, the fourth anniversary of the tsunami was last week, and many people spent the anniversary remembering people who didn't survive and recognising those who suffered and who continue to suffer for months and years after the disaster. Here on the beaches of BC, items that were swept away by the disaster continue to wash up. This story shows that we are all connected and it is our profound hope that one legacy of this tragedy will be increased awareness of everyday garbage in the ocean and cleaner shorelines. We would love for you guys to join the Great Canadian Shoreline Cleanup because we are all part of the solution to garbage in our oceans. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kate. Uh, so we'd like to go ahead and open it up for questions. If anyone has a question, please raise your hand and I'll be happy to come on over and... All right, good. The mic. For how long is it expected that um, tsunami debris will keep on uh, washing ashore? Um. So some of the models that were done to predict um, tsunami debris, they suggested that we should still be seeing it. We are still seeing it. It's still washing in after every single storm. And I think because of this, uh, the cycling of the ocean currents that we'd continue to see it for a long time. Like I said, that a lot of the plastic items are really long lived and some of them are actually going around again and then they're gonna come back. Um, so, you know, if there's some, there's some shipping containers that went missing in the 90s with hockey gloves or with rubber duckies, and you still find these things on the shore um, many, many years later. So I think we're going to see it for a lot longer to come. I'm going to take an online question while I walk across the theatre here. Um, uh, hi there. Are we testing the waters and materials being washed ashore on the Canadian coast for radiation? And if so, what are the current readings? Sure, we get asked that a lot. Um, is the tsunami debris radioactive? Should we be scared of it? Um, firstly, I just want to point out that a lot of the areas that were affected by the tsunami were actually not in the area of Fukushima. They're a little further north. Um, and also, the radiation problems didn't start until a few days after the tsunami, by which point a lot of the debris was already out in the ocean. So yes, tsunami debris was definitely tested. Um, there were a lot of concerns about radiation um, when it first started arriving. And things like boats that washed up with water in them, those kind of things were tested, um, a lot of items, and none of the readings came back with any significant measures of radiation, so. And uh, just to follow up on that, Kate, uh, so the, uh, the, the question, they, they also want to know if the waters were being tested. I think there All are right. some groups that are working on that. Yeah, so there's a group out of the University of Victoria um, and also a speaker who spoke here a few months ago um, who can talk more to that. Um, but basically, I think the latest results from the water testing, uh, which have probably come out in the last couple of weeks, show that there's no significant radiation, no measurable radiation in our waters. Okay, another question. What's an example of a personal item that's been found on the shore here and returned to someone in Japan? Sure, so the question was, what's an example of a personal item um, that we've found? So, some of the examples are um, a fishing crate that's a big plastic square crate like this. Um, and they look quite commercial, they don't look like they 
they look like they could be from anybody. Um, but on a cleanup in Euclid, some of the people who are on the cleanup were Japanese, and they were able to um, read the name. They recognised it as a family name. Um, they were able to trace the owner back in Japan, and the owner said, you know, when we look at it, we look at it as something that's plastic. Well, you know, it's a plastic crate. What could you want that for? He said his family has been fishermen. They've been fishermen for a long time, and his, he inherited this from his dad, um, who inherited it from his dad. And so to him, it had personal meaning. So I think through Japan Air, um, Hannah, who was in that photo, actually returned the crate to him, and it meant a lot to him. Um, other things that have been found, uh, I met, um, I can't remember his name, but I met a man in Japan who, his jet ski washed away in the tsunami, and it washed up near Hawaii. And they found it and they traced the registration to him. Um, and he said at first, he said at first he didn't want it because his house was destroyed and he was living in temporary housing. And he thought, what can I do with, <laughs> with a jet ski? Where am I going to put a jet ski? Um, but then he said, <laughs> I really liked this story. He said, then I remembered all the good times I'd had on my jet ski. And I thought, I would like to have it back for all the memories, even if it doesn't work anymore. So he had the jet ski returned to him. Um, I'm not sure how he's keeping it now uh, in his temporary housing, but he really appreciated the power of that and he really enjoyed knowing that the, he was connected by the ocean currents to somebody in Hawaii. Um, other things that have been found include property markers uh, that we can tell they've got the names of cities on them. Um, and also when I was in Haida Gwaii recently, there was a, um, some registration papers that were found in a bottle by uh, one of the incredible volunteers who does cleanups up there, Linda. And um, within a few days of us getting that to, to um, a Japanese, the Japanese, Japan Environmental Action Network, they traced the owner who had survived the tsunami, but his boat hadn't. So somehow his registration papers locked in a bottle, washed out from the boat. Um, yeah. Other things such as this, which is right here, this is a hand-painted symbol on here. And so... Um, this was found on the West Coast Trail, and it hasn't been traced to an owner, but it could be, because there's only probably one fisherman who's using this in Japan. Um, so yeah, there are lots of examples of those kind of stories. Any other questions? Jonathan? Some of the debris that's being washed ashore on the west coast has uh, sea creatures attached and quite uh, significantly covering them. Is there any uh, testing being going on to see what invasive species might be brought to our shore? Yeah, so um, the threat of an aquatic invasive species was another big thing that was uh, talked about when tsunami debris first started arriving. Um, basically because some of these things had been, for example, if it was a dock in Japan, it had been stationary there with, and so the species that were growing on it would be just from that area. And so when the thing was picked up and moved and carried across the ocean, that there would be a threat that there could be some kind of invasive species. Um, and yes, some things have been found in Oregon, for example, a big part of a dock was found with lots of growth on it. Um, on the cleanups that I've been on, I haven't seen anything like that. Um, a lot of the things that are out on the beach have been out there a long time. Um, because the tsunami was in 2011. Some of these beaches are so remote that you can't get to them that often. Um, and so a lot of the things have died off. But for sure, there are guidelines um, put out to be able to identify things and to be able to take samples um, if you do see anything like that, which we would definitely recommend. Um, it's still a possible threat. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we'll take a couple more questions and uh, sorry for the delay. They're always at the opposite end of the, of the theater. Uh, the slide of the uh, microplastics, how concentrated was that? Oh, I'm not sure. Uh, that would have been collected, I, I think that's from a paper by Dr. Peter Ross, who's here at, um, at the aquarium. Um, and I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, but it was published in a paper, I think, last year. Um, uh, I'll take a stab. I think that image was probably only a, uh, two or three square cent centimeters, on, like on each side. So two, four, four square centimeters, four to nine square centimeters. Not very large. It's pretty small. Any other questions? Going once? Going twice? Okay, thank you. 
Uh, I'd like to go ahead and thank, uh, thank you very much, Kate, for coming tonight and uh, helping really uh, helping all of us, but me in particular, like totally changed my view on uh, marine debris and that it's something that uh, uh, is very important. Uh, it's something that's happening every day and also giving more personal story to the tsunami tragedy um, and uh, uh, changed my perspective on how we can work together uh, across the Pacific uh, to bring people together and uh, raise awareness of, of debris in general. Uh, so Kate had mentioned microplastics in the presentation and I just wanted to let you know that we do have a talk coming up uh, with Dr. Peter Ross, our scientist for the Ocean Pollution Program here at the Vancouver Aquarium. On April 15th, he'll be giving a talk on microplastics in our ocean, which is an emerging uh, pollution threat in our oceans. A uh, very interesting topic. Uh, we also have another event on uh, March 24th next week uh, on, uh, that's promoting our Sea Monsters Revealed exhibition here at the Vancouver Aquarium. And that talk is on uh, Sea Monsters Fact or Fiction. So uh, you can come check that out. So I'd like to go ahead and thank everybody for coming uh, to visit us tonight and, and tuning in. Uh, for those of you here uh, at the Vancouver Aquarium, um, our gallery uh, adjacent to the theater is open. You're welcome to come uh, out, out here and enjoy some of our galleries and get a refreshment uh, before you head home tonight. Thank you very much and good night.